So our um, last speaker for the section is going to be Dr. Stéphane Boucher. Uh, Dr. Boucher is a cardiothoracic anesthesiologist uh, and, the, and, the direct, and the program director of the EACT IC Fellowship Training Center in uh, OVL Alast in Brussels, Bel Belgium. He's a board certified uh, member of the American Society of FECO, a FASE, uh, recognized a specialist. Um, he has um, He's been like a very like a very good and respected educator in the field of cardiothoracic anesthesia for POCUS and TE. He forms part of the member of the EACT IC TE exam committee and the educational committee and again the transplant committee. Um, other fields of research uh, have been like perioperative uh, process EEG and cardiac electrophysiology, including experimental animal research uh, using Langendorf heart preparations for research or arrhythmias. So with no further delay, um, please, uh, Dr. Boucher, go ahead and um, uh, tell us about uh, how can we predict RV failure, echocardiographic uh, assessment of RV reserve before LBAD implantation. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon for the people in Europe and good morning, I think, for the people in, in Canada. Um, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to give this lecture on the prediction of RV failure before uh, LVOT implantation. I'm affiliated with the Heart Centre of the OLV Clinic in Alst in Belgium, which has gained international reputation with names as Guy Hendricks, Pedro Brigada and Hugo von Ermen, who performed the first full thoracoscopic port access surgery in 1997. I have no, unfortunately, I don't have any disclosures. And when thinking about the heart, you um, need to consider the left and the right ventricle as partners, like in a marriage. And these two ventricles support each other in good days and bad days throughout life. But when you support one ventricle, the other one has to keep up with the supported ventricle. And that's why we see failure, right ventricular failure, um, in about 20 to 40% of patients after LVET implantations. Why? This is because of what's named interventricular interdependence. Changing the loading conditions on one side will affect the other side, as we can see in VA ECMO or LVET patients. We understand that the right ventricle is the key in LVET support, and also that it is the flow-limiting pump of the system. Importantly, right ventricular function depends on LV function for about 50% of contractility and septal contribution to RV contraction is also lost during LVAT support. So the right ventricular performance becomes more dependent on the free wall motion of the right ventricle. So as we unload the left ventricle with an LVAT, we also RV contractility changes in afterload. So what's really important is to go slow for the right ventricle after uh, implantation of the LVAT. Give the right ventricle time to adapt. Um, but what the main key question is, can we predict RV failure preoperatively before implantation of the LVAT? Now, what we do know is if you develop right ventricular failure after LVAT implantation, it's really bad. And it's bad early on, and it's bad later during LVAT support. Now, what are the traditional ways to assess right ventricular performance before implantation? We can go to the CAT lab and measure different pressures and other hemodynamic determinants, like, for example, right ventricular stroke work index, puppy, etc. Of course, we need to assess the right ventricle using echocardiography. We can measure dimensions, functional parameters, and combination of these parameters. 
which are used to determine whether the right ventricle is good enough to support LVAT flow. Now, this is what many people used to do, including myself, when assessing the right ventricle before LVAT implantation. And I used to combine dimensions, dimensions of the right ventricle with functional parameters in order to predict somewhat right ventricular performance. But a better way is to assess the right ventricle systematically um, and to answer, to give an answer to these different questions. Is the right ventricle dilated? Is there dysfunction of the right ventricle? And is there intrinsic disease of the right ventricle? The third question, I will not, not discuss this in this lecture, but the two first questions are really important. First, is the right ventricle dilated? Right ventricular dilation, and especially the ratio between the right and the left, has been demonstrated in multiple studies to be independently associated with right ventricular heart failure and uh, mortality. Next, you should assess the right ventricle functionally by using functional parameters, like, uh, for example, ejection fraction, the good old TAPC, or strain. Pre-implant right ventricular uh, free wall strain is considered predictive of RV failure in the first post-operative year after LVAT implantations. Although cutoffs values still vary between 9 and 6. A point to consider is the fact that TAPC will decrease after cardiac surgery, which is less prominent for strain values. Also becoming very popular, as we already heard in the previous lectures, is uh, the determination of RVPA coupling, which relates contractility with afterload. And Brenner determined a cutoff value of 0.5 as a powerful predictor of two-year adverse outcomes in patients with heart failure. But this has to be validated as a predictor for LVAT patients. A good alternative for the de determination of RV coupling is the ratio between the TAPC and the RV systolic pressure, which has been used already prior to LVAT implantation to assess the right ventricle. The advantage of calculating the coupling before implantation is that physicians could try to improve the coupling using medical therapy uh, to optimize right ventricular function prior to LVAT implantation. Finally, and maybe I think the most interesting part is to assess whether the right ventricle, right ventricular dysfunction is related, especially in LVAT patients, to pure LV congestion or the combination of uh, congestion and pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, EPLAR was considered to be a valid method by combining left-sided filling pressures and maximal tricuspid regurgitation velocity. If right ventricular pressure is increased with increased filling pressures, post-capillary pulmonary hypertension should be considered, while an increase in right ventricular pressure with normal filling pressures is more related to pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. But the truth is that none of these parameters work very well in isolation to predict RV failure. They only relate to uh, what's measured on that moment and do not tell anything about the dynamics of uh, the right ventricle when uh, implanting an LVAT. The only thing we know for sure is that severe right ventricular dysfunction will lead to poor performance of the right ventricle. Now, when you have time, you can also try to calculate risk scores in order to predict right ventricular failure. And these are the most current uh, risk scores. But as you can see, these are not very good in predicting RV failure. And you'll notice these scores are situated close to the 45 degree dashed line, which means that the prediction and, and that line is not better than flipping a coin. What we try to do is to unmask the bad right ventricle by looking 
at the right ventricular reserve. Now, what's the right ventricular reserve? We're looking at the performance when unloading the left ventricle should be able to uh, determine this reserve or looking at the changes in right ventricular contractility at different levels of LV unloading. Why? The problem is that you can almost um, find normally um, appearing right ventricles on echocardiography, but they have modest inotropic reserve and they can dramatically increase filling pressures um, uh, acutely. So you really need to look further than only hemodynamic and echocardiographic assessment. Now you can challenge the right ventricle by unloading the left ventricle in the cat lab using nitroprusside infusion, for example. An increase in stroke volume and a peak stroke volume was significantly associated uh, to right ventricular heart failure with a cutoff value of 22.1 ml. You can also look at the uh, PAPI values and despite a wide variability, a higher PAPI value suggests a better RV functional reserve. At the same time, you can look at dynamic echocardiographic variables like the change in TAPSI um, during the challenge. An increase of about 50% of the TAPSI values suggest a better reserve of the right ventricle. But can we do better? Yes, we can. We can use our good pressure volume loops in order to assess both the right and left ventricle before elevate support. And there are already several clinical applications where we uh, already use PV analysis, um, which enables us to get details about the systolic and diastolic function of both the right and the left ventricle. Now, we know that elevate support comes with interactions, serial interactions, which relate to changes in the flow, and diastolic interactions, uh, which relate to changes in volume and interventricular adaptations. Brenner was able to describe some of these interactions after elevate implantations, although in a limited number of patients. And usually you will find some reduction in systolic function, but also uh, what you should find usually is a more compliant right ventricle and diastolic properties. Now, before surgery, we can actually look at the behavior of the right ventricle during such a challenge in the cat lab, for example, before um, implanting an LVET. We can expect after implantation systolic and diastolic changes. Contractility will decrease, we know that, while preload increases and there is a variable change in the afterload for the right ventricle. And as already discussed by the previous speaker, we are able to reproduce pressure volume loops by adding or combining data of both pressure and volume um, in an application. And um, this is an example um, of a right ventricular pressure volume loop of a patient before LVAT support. But interestingly, you can actually also at the same time look at the behavior, uh, the pressure volume loop of the left ventricle during a challenge. And here are um, simulations of two different patients. On the left side, you will be able to see an increase in the stroke volume, both in the right and left ventricle. But you will also notice a more compliant right ventricle as shown by the decrease in the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. On the right side, you will find a limited increase in stroke volume, but without a change in diastolic compliance. And as you might expect, the right ventricle on the right will perform worse in the patient there compared to the patient on the left. The echocardiographic image of uh, such a patient um, on the right is shown here in this image before and after implantation. 
Although the echocardiographic image on the left wasn't really bad, and uh, to be honest, I've seen worse um, before implantation, um, this right ventricle really behaved badly after implantations. And it took us quite some time to get this right ventricle going uh, after the um, implantation in the intensive care. We usually combine pressure data with right ventricular volumes, but this article um, from the group of Professor Tello uh, showed that you are actually able to produce pressure volume loops, um, or at least um, the upper part of the pressure volume loops using only echo-derived data. Now, before concluding, I want to state that the use of pressure volume loops during unloading of the heart is still under investigation. And in Belgium, the number of LVET implantations is rather limited. So actually, as already mentioned, um, we're looking forward to some collaboration with other centra in order to get sufficient data of this very pro promising project, which includes um, pressure volume loops. I want to conclude by saying that the value of um, echocardiographic measurements for the prediction of RV failure is rather limited. Dynamic measurements using pharmacologic alveol loading are, uh, are better, are more discriminative. The best way, but it needs certainly clinical validation, are um, preoperatively the PV loops which um, during a challenge may uh, suggest or uh, simulate the changes during the unloading by the LVAT. And pressure volume analysis is really a potent platform for describing the right ventricle, but also the left ventricle in both physiology and pathophysiology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was great. Um, and thank you for, for putting it so easy for us. Um, okay, so now we are going to, because we are a little bit over the time, so we are going to have 10 minutes for Q&As. So we already have a couple of questions in the Q&A section. Uh, the first one actually um, question is from Matthew Griffey. Um, he mentions like uh, we have an endless debate in post bypass the studies between whether it is valid to say that uh, RB is dilated but RB function is normal versus to conclude that the RB lateral wall motion is reassuring but RB is overloaded and dilated. Uh, what do the group thinks? Um, can we say that an objectively dilated RB is normal or if it's actually a normal RB function? This does uh, have implications for deciding on whether to do further fluid challenge in the case of post bypass and post op hypotension. Right. Uh, so that's the first question. Who wants to actually go ahead and, and answer, please? Okay. Go ahead, please, Sasha. Perhaps I can start and the others can join. Uh, I think this is a very important question oh, to determine what is normal and what is abnormal. And I think in this question, there is a mixture of two uh, functioning meanings. On the one hand, this might be assessed with a morphometry, which will then relate to right ventricular dilation. This is more or less the preload of the, of the right ventricle. Okay, so whenever there is a dilation in uh, in the right ventricle, there is hemodynamic stress on the right ventricle. Perhaps Fabio can add some more from his uh, uh, context of the uh, coupling. And the other thing is just the myocardial perfusion and the contractility, so the functioning of the cardiomyocytes of mostly the free wall of the right ventricle. So th this is the, the systolic part. So um, this is a mixer. So systolic function of the right ventricle 
So a reduced strain, tapsy, ejection fraction will occur then when there is an impaired cardiomyocytes function, mostly driven by impaired myocardial perfusion. So from this part, you have to say that a, a right ventricular dilation with a normal systolic function is, a, is the first part of this function. And then if the right ventricle is not able to fill the left ventricle and thus the left ventricle is not able to put out a stroke volume which then turns into myocardial perfusion then there is a decrease in uh, systolic function so perhaps this may help from from me from a hemodynamic point of view can i add a comment here, uh, if, if you can hear me Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, following what Sasha just said, I would mm -hmm. like to add a comment. Um, are we speaking of a new right ventricle, or are we speaking of a, vent a right ventricle that was already dilated prior to surgery? Because it's very different. I suppose we are speaking about a newly dilation, a new dilation, new dilatation after CPB, probably in the OR. Um, this gives you opportunity to this within the context of the interaction of the right ventricle to the pulmonary circulation. So it is dilated, but is it a, a diastolic overload or is it a pressure overload? Um, what about the interaction between this right, dilated right ventricle and the pulmonary circulation. It also depends on the type of surgery the patient has just undergone. For example, uh, the pre-existing cardiovascular condition the patient showed before surgery and so on. So my comment is that this, is a, this question is a good example that we need to think about um, a combined ventricle and, and the circulation system, not only concentrate on a single echo picture showing maybe an increased diameter of a, a heart chamber, in this case, a right ventricle. It's much more complex than saying the diameter is increased or the ventricle is, is dilated. That was my, my first. Thank you very much, Fabio. So um, we have a second question uh, from the panel uh, from uh, Leonid Minkovic. Um, has RBL stance uh, measured by TAPSI-PAP validated in cardiac surgery, bearing in mind that pericardial opening might significantly affect TAPSI? Well, I, I can start, but I'm sure that the other colleagues will also comment on this, uh, Jacobo. Yeah. Um, we heard from all the speakers that we still uh, lack consensus on uh, definition and also in the setting of cardiac surgery. Most of the, the, the measurements we apply, and they were very nicely shown by the, my colleagues, uh, have all uh, been validated in the cardiology setting. And most of the studies, most of the recommendations, most of the guidelines refer to transthoracic. So we should be very well aware of this. Having said that, of course, the right ventricular coupling suffers the same limitation. There is no validation yet of this specific uh, a non-invasive approach to coupling in the cardiac surgical setting, independent of the pericardial opening or whatever. There is no validation. There are studies as, as it has been shown, but we still need to surgery uh, field. Okay, I think Marcin wanted to add uh, something. Go ahead, please. Um... First of all, thank you so much for a wonderful session. I have two questions, uh, one uh, to all of you and, and one to Stefan. Um, 
what are your absolute no when you see the patients before elvat uh, implantation in context of rv failure when in at which values of puppy or, or whatever you decide you just say this patient is not gonna do, uh, do well uh, and this is too much push or or maybe you flip a coin and you said well we go for elvat but we have arvat as a backup and the second question is we already saw that you are cooperating closely doing strain rv loops conductance how far we are from translation to clinical practice and particularly in context of of our symposium how far we are from integrating this information to what we see on PE. Thanks again, guys. Well, it's a very good question. Um, as I mentioned, um, don't rely on a, a single echocardiographic parameter. That's the first thing. You have to combine um, clinical hemodynamic and echocardiographic uh, parameters to adequately assess the right ventricle. That's the first point. I've seen really bad right ventricles who perform very well after LVAT implantation and vice versa. I've, I've seen ventricles that are looking not bad and performing good before surgery and are doing really worse um, really bad after implantation. So I think you need to, to take a look at the different things at the same time. And there is, of course, no holy grail to predict um, whether or not this right ventricle will fail. There is also something um, about the management of LVET um, after implantation, hemodynamic management. Um, if, you, if you turn the rotational speed up too fast, um, almost in every ventricle, this right ventricle will behave badly. So you need to give the right ventricle some time and need to um, yeah, handle the information preoperatively. But I think the best way is to use um, dynamic challenges before surgery, because then you are able to look at what the right ventricle um, is able at. Uh, does it change its performance? Uh, does it tolerate well the unloading? I think that's the dynamic um, uh, assessment is much more uh, is much way better to 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 assess the right ventricle than only getting an echocardiographic image and and measuring some pressures. That's at least my my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. I am coming back to Sasha that he has his hand up. Wanted to mention something. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a combination uh, towards your question, Marcin, and to what Fabio said before. And I also agree absolutely with uh, Stefan. I think there will never be this clear cut of measurement uh, which is working in every patient. And Stefan just told it, and this is not only for cardiac surgery, whether the thorax is open or even for non-cardiac surgery, it's more or less a situation that has to be uh, being put into a clinical uh, context. So whenever you need, you, you have problems coming off bypass, or you need a high dose of vasopressors in the ICU for an ADS patient, okay, then probably there is something wrong. And then any finding, even a qualitative finding, as demonstrated in my talk, like the RVLV index, may be uh, helpful in then this uh, separating different uh, uh, hemodynamic scenarios. And I think the most important factor is that you do not only one echo, but that you have a serial hemodynamic workup, including echo. So at least here in Germany, uh, in non-cardiac surgery, there has been started a huge debate because transthoracic echocardiography has been rated very high by the European Society of the Cardiologists and Anesthesiologists before non-cardiac surgery to undergo the patients when they are in high risk, okay? 
However, most of the researchers, they try to find with this pre-op echo a clear, like Stefan said, prediction of what comes out. So I think when everything works out smoothly, then there is a, a static line which we can follow up. However, when the surgeon uh, um, has difficulties and he cuts perhaps like in the vena cava inferior and there's mass bleeding, then there is a new condition within just immediately seconds, which is impacting the patient's outcome. However, in these scenarios, if you have a pre-op echo, then you can see what may be a normal left ventricle in a resting state. And then these can be targets for your hemodynamic interventions you use in the OR, ICU, or whatever. And of course, there may be some gray zones, but then you have to be come back to a clinical point. When you see, let's say, there is a hypovolemic uh, ventricle, so you fill him up. If the ventricle then is still uh, um, not good within a good shape concerning contratility, you look if perfusion pressure is okay. So perhaps you add vas you add a vasopressor. Is still the ventricle is bad? You add, add an inotrope and so on. And then if you then see that lactate or other perfusion parameters decrease according to your therapy, then you implemented a successful stressing strategy. So I think we are much more, uh, and we have to put more our clinical context, our hemodynamic clinical context into this therapy than just saying it's just one measurement on what we can rely on. Perhaps like a very personal statement of mine. So I need to apologize now, but we are over the, the 10 minutes and then the rest of the speakers needs to go ahead. I have several of my questions, but I want to apologize to Victor that he just posted a, a question on the Q&A, but we will answer it uh, on the Q&A panel. So thank you very much to everyone. That was a great session. I love Arby, so I, I really enjoy your lectures. Thank you very much for being part of this symposium. We appreciate uh, you being here and we know how difficult it is for you, especially with the time zone change. And um, and those were great presentations. Marcin. Thank you so much, guys. Fantastic presentations. Uh, see you again. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye.